I've been invited by the brilliant Tenstack team to help them build a new Tenstack library, and the library is called Tenstack DevTools. If you don't know, I've already built Remix DevTools and React Router DevTools, and this felt like a natural transition into building something greater for the whole ecosystem. Well, today I want to talk about what I've built and why it's exciting, and why you should care about it. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So the first thing is, it's in alpha, so you can download it right now and play around with it, and the core of it is stable. The reason it's in alpha is because we have a lot of features to add and a lot of docs to write, so don't be scared of the alpha phase, try it out in your projects and you're gonna love it. Why are you gonna love it? Well, the reason you're gonna love it is because this is not only for Tenstack, this is for every dev tool out there. So if you're an ORM, if you're a state management library, if you're React Query, whatever, you can use Tenstack DevTools to plug your DevTool plugins in and show some useful information to your users. Whatever you're building, you can add it to Tenstack DevTools. So let's talk about the features. If I open up the docs, they are pretty barren at the moment because I still haven't gotten around to writing them. But what's important for you to know is that it's framework agnostic, which means this can run anywhere. It's built for vanilla JavaScript, so you can run it in React, you can run it in Solid, you can run it in Vue, Svelte, whatever you want. The ecosystem is going to need to write plugins and adapt to these things, but after a while we hope we will have a lot of coverage in the ecosystem, so that's pretty neat. It's customizable and built for plugins, and what that means is it's just a shell that lets you add your DevTool plugins into them. The lightweight part, it's around 20 kilobytes, the shell of it. I don't think it's gonna grow much larger than that. If you want an analogy of what we are building here, it's basically something like a Docker for frontend, where you have our own shell that's gonna allow you to add your plugins in, like images. So that's what Tenstack DevTools boils down to, and I'm gonna explain the architecture behind it very shortly. So, if you want to build your plugins, you have the docs, but I'm going to show you what the architecture is and how you can use stuff like plugins to build something cool. But before we do that, I briefly want to go over the architecture. The architecture is comprised of a few parts. The first part is the shell. So these would be your Tenstack DevTools. So, Tenstack DevTools. Now the Tenstack DevTools are a headless shell and by themselves, they just have a panel that just goes up and down, and that's it. So, why do you care about it? Well, because it's headless, it's built for plugins. And the way it works is, you add your plugin config in. So, for example, in React, you would do something like plugins, and then you give it an array of plugins here. And then this gets passed into the Tenstack Dev Tools, and then they render the plugins. So, for example, plugin one, plugin two, plugin three. And the cool thing about the Dev Tools as well is they come in with a built-in event bus. And the event bus is used to communicate between third-party libraries and their respective plugins. So for example, let's say we have a library here and we are going to use uh, Tenstack query for this. And I'm gonna, and we expand this so it looks a little bit better. And let's say at the moment, how you would set up your dev tools is you would have to wrap your app with a provider the provider would provide the query client to the Tenstack query dev tools, and then they would show you the information. Well, the issue with that is that you would have to nest the dev tools in the query provider. You would need to have the provider and then in other adapters like solid or view or something else, you can't use the react context, for example, to do that, but you would have to use their own context and stuff like that. So, it's not really scalable. And another issue is if you want to communicate, let's say you want to, in your dev tools, you want to listen to another plugin as well. Let's say you have Tenstack router here. And let's say 
this library wants to also listen to, to what's going on in the query and they together create a plugin. Well, that's impossible to do at the moment because they are completely isolated from each other and there's no way for them to communicate. Well, this is where the event bus comes in. The cool thing about the event bus is you add a very lightweight client to your application, so your library like Tenstack Query or Tenstack Router, and that client then communicates with the event bus. So it either sends the events to the event bus or listens to the events from the event bus. Sorry for the rough cut, I realized I was in the way. So the event bus listens to and emits events, but it doesn't just work for the library. If you have your plugin here, so for example, it's listening to the events emitted by Tenstack Query, it's gonna get received inside of here. And this would be your Tenstack Query DevTools, for example. And then they are listening to whatever is being emitted, and then they can also emit events back to the Tenstack Query library. So what this would mean is, for example, if you want to implement a feature where you refresh some queries or you want to uh, time travel in the sense of moving uh, the state of your app forward and backwards, that's probably very hard to do if it's not tightly coupled with like a context or something like that. Well, this allows you to do that very easily without you having to provide some custom implementations to share the state. The DevTools themselves handle this for you. They listen and emit events. And all you have to do is either listen on one side or emit on the other. And it's really up to you how you implement this. And this also works with a server. So there is a built-in event bus in the client DevTools, which can also connect to an event bus on the server. So if you emit an event, this would then send it to the event bus and the event bus would send the event to a server. And then the server would pipe those events further. So for example, let's say you have a 10 stack query on the client and on the server. If this from the client emits an event, it goes to the client event bus, this sends it to the server event bus, and then this sends it to your 10 stack query on the server. And this is all set up for you, so you don't really have to think about it. All you have to do is emit events or listen to events. And then, for example, if you want to listen in this plugin to your Tenstack query, you would just subscribe to the event. And for example, this would be your, for example, Zustand plugin. So your Zustand plugin listens to Tenstack query, it uses the queries to do something, and then shows you the UI. And it also maybe listens to Tenstack router, so whenever this is emitted to the event bus, it's also sent to Zustand plugin. And the cool thing about this architecture is that it's really decoupled and you can use the plugins to listen to whatever you want with the event client and you can easily interact between plugins and between separate libraries without having to collab with the library team to bring some features in to allow you to do that or something like that. As long as the core library is emitting the events, you can listen to them and do whatever you want in your plugin. And that's really cool because, for example, if you want to listen to five different core libraries like Prisma, Drizzle, Sustand, uh, something else like Zod, and they all emit their own events, you can easily do so just by listening to a specific event that all of these plugins emit. And that is a brief overview of the architecture. So now let me show you how this works in action, where we will implement a plugin, where we will listen to a Zustand store and create a timeline where you can scroll through the current state and revert it back or move forward. So basically time travel. All right, so this is the DevTools repository and I'm gonna show you how to do this by implementing a really simple plugin that allows you to try and travel through two stand store states.
Considering I've already prepared an example, I will explain everything you need to know and how it works. In this example repository, I have already prepared everything and this is publicly available at Tenstack DevTools. So if you go there and under examples, you'll have in the React example time travel and you can check out the repository there to understand how this works. So the two things we need is the Tenstack DevTools event client. So this is the client that emits and listens to events and the React flavor of the DevTools. You either have the solid or the React ones at the moment, and we will add frameworks later on. This is what we are using for the React plugin. And I've created two files. The first one is Zustand client here, and the other one is Zustand time travel. And let's start with the Zustand client. I'm gonna first go to the store here, and we will come back to the examples above. And the store just creates a store from Zustand. I give it the type, so the count, the increment, and the decrement. And basically what it does, it increments the count, so pretty simple example. But if you see here, we, the set function is wrapped in a way that it does something else besides setting the state. So what it does is it emits state change events on every state change and this gets sent to the DevTools event bus and the event bus distributes this to whoever is listening to these events and the cool thing about this so the way this works is you import the event client from the Tenstack DevTools event client and then you define your event map because we don't know what the state change is we are going to set it to any here this could be done a little bit smarter, but for the sake of the example, we don't want to go too crazy on this. And you also have the revert snapshot. And this is important because we want to use this event to revert to whatever it was before. So we declare a new event client, we give it the event map and the plugin ID. So in our example, Zustand, and these events here have to start with Sustand and then you define the event name, so like this. And then you define the type on the right, obviously. So this event client now can emit events or listen to them. And here we are emitting the state change event and we are setting the count to be the state dot count plus one or minus one. And we are emitting this event to the client bus and that's it. So now, obviously, you might be thinking, okay, we emit the events, but what happens next? Well, in the Zustan time travel, we create a plugin for our dev tools. So this gets exported here. And in our setup here, I've already set up the Tenstack dev tools. And in the plugin array, I've popped in the Zustan time travel plugin that you just saw. So this one into here and now this gets rendered in the DevTools. So in here, we are going to import the event client and then in the use effect, we're gonna listen on a state change event. So whenever a state change happens, wherever it's emitted, we want to listen to that. And when we get that event, we want to set the snapshots in the plugin itself so if you think about it, this plugin could be a completely different NPM package from your Zustand package. And these would still communicate between each other and emit events and listen to events. And you don't have to do any setup at all. And now that we are listening to this state change event, whenever we get one, we set the payload in the snapshots array here. And basically here we just have an input that's type of range. The maximum is the snapshot maximum. And then whenever we scroll it, so we pull it to the left or to the right, we basically emit a revert snapshot event to the client event bus. And it's going to be the payload that we have gotten before. So basically event payload, which is in our case count. And this gets emitted. So what are we doing? We are emitting the state change event from the Zustand client here. So we emit these events. 
inside of our plugin, we listen to these events and store them in snapshots. And then whenever we change the snapshot, we emit a reverse snapshot event. So if you're thinking about how this works, you can obviously see that now we need to listen to this event in the library and then change it there. So if we go to the Zustadt client, we scroll down and you, as you can see, we are listening to the reverse snapshot event here. And we basically say store.setState and the count is whatever we have gotten from the server. So how does this work in action? Well, let's check it out. So I'm going to run this. It's running on localhost 3005. I'm going to open it. And as you can see, we have our dev tools. So here is the icon. And you can see Tsushan time travel here. And the current count is zero. And we have the increment and decrement buttons. And if I bring up the dev tools, I have these three plugins. But I care about the Tsushan time travel one. And here, if I lower this a bit to here. And if I increment to 10 and then decrement to 5, and then if I scroll this, you can see that I'm reverting to the snapshot that's stored in the plugin. So the plugin itself and the library are communicating in between each other, and they're setting the state either in the plugin or in your application. And that's one of the million ways you can use this, and it's really up to you how you use it. But I think this is really a cool example of how you can do time travel. And if you know already, Redux does this. The Redux DevTools also have this feature. And this is how you do this inside of the Tensite DevTools. It's pretty easy. And for example, if a library like Sustand added the event emitter, this could be available to everybody to listen to and do whatever they want in their applications. And that's pretty much it. So how it works is you have your plugins, you have your event bus, it emits and listens to events. And for example, if I check these out, you can click on the plugins, you can do whatever you want with them. You can have multiple plugins of Tenstack without having like seven icons in, in this corner here, which is also cool. And you also have the settings that let you like set if it's open by default, if you hide the trigger until Howard, if you require a URL flag to even see them, hotkeys to open and close them, the position of the trigger and the panel. So for example, I can put it on the top or I can move it to the bottom. And yeah, that's pretty much it for today's video. I just wanted to show you briefly how the dev tools work and I hope you're excited to use them and play around with them as much as I am. I'm hoping the ecosystem loves this enough to add the event client to their libraries. The event client implementation itself is really lightweight. It's like 300 bytes. So it's really not that much of a burden on your bundle. So that's also really cool. And yeah, thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.